Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to provide education and inspiration for any entrepreneur, but especially those of us in the event industry and consumers. Uh, I want to mention that I'm excited my social media handle is uh, finally much better branded. It is now The Wedding Biz. So uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram at The Wedding Biz. Uh, And I want to say that I'm going to be speaking on Tuesday, July 16th at the upcoming NACE National Conference. Uh, And the topic is going to be leveraging podcasts for your business as a marketing and educational tool. So I want to mention that if you did miss last week's episodes, wow, was it something else? Kiana Underwood, founder of Tulipina, one of the premier floral designers in the world with workshops selling out everywhere, Uh, a wonderful book. And also, uh, she has the most, really the highest Instagram followers of any floral designer. And her work is just stunning. Just go to her Instagram page. So, this week's guest is Mark Ingram of Mark Ingram Atelier. And I was fortunate enough to meet him and interview him at his atelier in New York City, which was very exciting. Mark is the owner of the premier bridal salon catering worldwide to a select clientele, including upscale, sophisticated brides and celebrities from the stage and screen, as well as the who's who of New York society and the fashion industry. We had such a great talk. Mark is such a good guy. He talks about his journey from childhood that includes this incredible story about a major influence, how this influence of fashion had on him at four or five years old. It is the coolest story. Also, uh, a myriad of interesting jobs that he had leading up to the opening of his own atelier. And we talk about his process all along the way from how he chooses what he's going to show to how he works with brides, talks about why he views dressing people as an art And also talks about his own international travel and trunk shows and what we in the industry can advise brides as to what the best investment is for them related to their gown. He also uh, has a brand new collection. It's really the first for him of his own called Mark Ingram Valentini. So, we get into a whole lot more than that too. So, enjoy my conversation with Mark Ingram. So, Mark, this is so much fun. I have been wanting to sit down with you for a very long time. So, oh, thank, thank you, you for having thank me you here so in your atelier. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Yeah, I get to actually see it for myself. Many people are jealous who are listening. <laughs> so, you know, Mark, one of the first things I, I was reading about you, I had a real close relationship with my grandfather, yes. my grandparents, and on my mother's side. And so, I was really touched when I read that your grandparents you know, love to take you window shopping. It's yeah. on Fifth Avenue when you were, dre- when you yeah. were I guess, young and very young, dressing up. How old were you in this Not happened? only window shopping. You know, I can remember, well, they say the stroller age, you know, but of course my memory would go back to about three or four. Wow. And it wasn't just window shopping. It was shopping in the stores because they were avid shoppers. They loved fashion. Uh, yeah. You had the charge accounts to all the stores. And my grandparents were very snappy dressers, you know, so Berdorf Goodman, Lord & Taylor at the time, which was a very upscale store, yeah. Saks Fifth Avenue were the Altman's and Best in Company was was the route, you know? That was the route. Do you remember, I, I guess for you to remember back to three or four, it had a huge impression on you. It did because, you know, clothes were an important part of their life, therefore became an important part of my life. We're talking about the 1960s, early 60s. People dressed differently. They behaved differently. Yeah. You wouldn't dare go to Saks Fifth Avenue in a tank top and shorts. Right. You know, like you just, today you just with wouldn't sandals. do it. You yeah. know, Some, sometimes we wore hats and gloves to go shopping. That's how... That's how important it was, you know, in retail, wasn't it? it was theater. And retail was a beautiful thing to do. I had a lot of my clothes custom made, which was kind of- At that age? At that, even kind young? Kind of weird, yeah. My grandparents were like, were like that. And D- so, yeah. B. Altman's and Best in Company in New York, they were department stores. You probably don't even know what they are. But Best in Company and B- was, at, was now where Olympic Tower is on Fifth Avenue next to, mm-hmm. next to St. Patrick's Cathedral. And B. Altman's is now was on 34th Street between 34th and 35th on Fifth Avenue. They were huge stores. Both of which had very developed children's wear departments, known for children's clothes. 
Wow. Well, was it your grandparents who raised you? Is that you, why? No, no, no. My, my parents, that was the first grandchild. Yeah. Came a little late in life, you know, to my grandparents. <laughs> they were a little old. They were, they were not so old. They were in their 60s, I guess, 50s. The first grandchild, they, go, only, they only had one son, my father. So it was a boy and they loved clothes. So, you know, and, then, and, they, and my parents would easily push me off on them. You I was going like, to say, what did your parents think about this? Like when because, you would come home with these outfits, what, well, what no, would they Well, no, because say? it wasn't like all the time, you know, we yeah. were seasonal. We have seasonal, seasonal wardrobes. Okay. You know, well, they were savvy, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. So, you know, we had clothes for the winter, clothes for summer, clothes for the resort, whatever. And, you know, we go to Best & Company B. Altman's because they had the best men's clothing. And my grandfather loved great tailoring. Mm. And they had been, not that they were in the garment, my grandparents were not in the garment industry at all. They really, no, they were. They were related to garment industry because they worked, I'm trying to think of what they did, but they, they, you know, were related to fashion for sure. Mm -hmm. As was my grandmother, who was a was a draper. So I had a background in, you know, the in, in ready to wear and and, a, and in my gen, my DNA, you know, was fashion too. Yeah. My mother also and father were very fashionable, but they were too busy, you know, young couple having a kid. So grand, I was spoiled. My grandparents had me. This is what they enjoyed doing, between either ball games or fashion. And we go into store, and I'd have these custom made. I have to go fit for fittings and be Altman's. And Mrs. Gower was my salesperson. We'd have my camel hair coat made every winter with the leg with the leather leggings and the matching caps and all that kind of stuff. So know? would you say, I mean, it's interesting. So many people I speak to in this industry have some kind of experience growing up or, or whatever through their parents or the environment, something yes. that clearly had such an effect on who they are today. Yeah. Do you think it was more the environment in the sense that that was the environment you were in who yeah. made you who you are today? Or do you think you had an innate passion for this anyway? Because I would bet it's a little of both. It's both. You know, if you look at my family wall in my store, I, yeah. you will when I saw it when I walked yeah. in. Yeah. You look at sort of three or four generations of Ingrams, what they looked like from the turn of the century, 1900 to 1960s. You know, they were... Uh, kind of progressive black family in yeah. America. They liked fashion. Mm -hmm. They were able to to have nice clothes. They had very nice social lives. And so this is what I grew up in. You know, it must be in the DNA. When you like when you like clothes and style and have certain aesthetic, it is definitely genetic. And it comes comes down from both sides of my family. But then on top of that, environmentally, spending all that time with my grandparents who loved to do that, they're also very formal people. You know, they were they were fun and they joke, but when they entertained, it was very serious. When they dressed, it was very serious. So I'm a very I'm a kind of formal person myself. You know, I'm kind of formal and old fashioned in that way. Yeah, interesting. So, well, then where did you go from there in terms of like high school? What were you doing? Well, did this manifest in the other whole ways? World changed. You know, my sister sister came along in 1964, and you know, then more tension, less attention on me, more I, more. Listen, on both I of us, know what that, and that the, was uh, fine. I sibling rivalry, no, right? Not at all. My sister no? was fabulous. And <laughs> they loved her to do as equally as they love me. But my sister wasn't in, but the times were also changing. You know, my grandparents moved from the city out to New Jersey. Uh -huh. That changed the dynamic because I was very closely situated to them when I was a kid. I could, you know, go, go down there to their apartment very easily. Yeah. And then when they moved to New Jersey, it was a little further. So it became more like special weekends to go and have holiday dinners. I and my, see. My, and my sister really wasn't into that kind of thing like I was. She didn't care about it. She still doesn't care about it, which is kind of funny. Uh, she doesn't care about clothes like I care about clothes. She uh -huh. looks great, but she doesn't care about clothes. Mm. I cared about clothes. I got that, you know, from my grandfather and grandmother, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, also times were changing. Things got very casual. You know, the Vietnam, Vietnam War changed a lot of things, mm. attitudes what you wore traveling, what you wore into a department store, what you wore to Broadway theater, it all loosened up. It I remember even up. like Vegas, because I used to be in a corporate situation and they had a con conference out there. I remember we would dress up for everything. We would dress up on airplanes. Of course right? you did. You I had to dress up that. on airplane. Every, it's all done. Yeah, it's all you're gone. matching luggage. You looked fabulous. I you, miss know? Yeah. you know what? I do kind of miss yeah. that. I really very, do. It was very nice. Dressing up on train travel was very important yeah. for us and my family. Dressing up on a train. So know? high school, what did you do? Did well, high school was the 70s. I this? became a you know kind of a hippie-ish kind of kid. I went to a very- Did you have like a huge effort or anything like that? As Michael, Listen, Michael Jackson Afro. Huge. I had when I was yeah. seventeen. I yeah. had one. You We're gonna really? have to compare yes. pictures. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Huge Michael Jackson Afro. I went to high school of music and art, which was lo located in Harlem at that time on One Thirty Fifth Street and Saint Nicholas Terrace. A very progressive, very artistic, very out there high school. It's part of the LaGuardia school system. Part of LaGuardia now. It 
it merged with performing arts and is now at Lincoln Center as of maybe 30 years. Jeez. But I was supposed to be the first graduating class of 76 to to graduate from the new location. But what but it aspect didn't happen. of it? Music or I was art? in music. You, an instrument? Yes, instrument and vocal. Interesting. Yeah, what so instrument were you? I played the clarinet. I've been playing clarinet, clarinet lessons since third grade. Yeah. So I played the clarinet for about 12 years. Uh, classical clarinet. And then I also had voice i could sing because my mother's well, what family. style of music like more um, standards kind well, of thing? at that time for some reason, reason using choruses you know yeah. choral music and classical you know liturgical music and religious music and classical you know things like that but in etudes and 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 broadway show things you know we were in chorus in high school mm-hmm. it was a very much po- good to performance yeah but i also personally i like jazz and standards you know i'm sort of an old-fashioned guy so if i sang publicly which i have done professionally I'd be more about a jazz, kind of a jazz singer, mm. you know, in the mold of a Nat King Cole, Bobby Short. That's kind of my vibe. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say Nat King Cole. So so what yeah. about after high school then? Did you go to college? I went to NYU. Yeah. Oh, Not, that's no right. No music. Anyway. No music. That so was wh- done. Well, what what was the transition there? Because that's, a, you know, when you're passionate about music. I wasn't passionate about music. No, I, I loved it as a hobby, but not as a... But not, you went to school for I, it. I, yeah, but it, because it was, a, it was a high school that didn't prepare you for a career. Yeah. It had music oh, it was and more art fun, hobby. as a, an enrichment. I Because got performing you. arts, yeah. high school, were for those kids who really wanted to go into the performing mm. arts. Music and art was an academic high school that had a very enriched music and art program. Yes, a lot of kids did go on. I mean, they're famous, very famous actors, very famous musicians, and very famous mm-hmm. artists who come out of my high school. But a lot of my fr- and a lot of my friends did pursue the arts. You know, I p- pursued it in terms of fashion. That's sort of art too. Mm-hmm. You know, and and and, and self expression in that way. Um, I went to NYU, got a degree in business, marketing and management. Uh, my parents really weren't so keen on me going to FIT. That was my dream to go to FIT because I wanted to be like a, a buyer and a fashion merchandiser and a, and a fashion director was the job I really wanted. Hmm. Fashion director at Bird of Goodman. That's the job I really wanted as a kid because that was a very important job, <laughs> a very big job in those days. Well, then, then what is. happened after college? I mean, well, I, I've read all these things about you. You went to I, IBM? I did go to because I worked Where'd for you IBM. Find that I, you know, the things I took a little hiatus from Bird of Goodman and went to IBM for a couple of months. Doing and what to sell copiers? I and mean, in those days, copiers were um, huge things. You I had do on the remember floor. they were yeah. like massive machines <laughs> in the nineteen nineteen eighties. You know, you put in paper and it spit out paper. You know, it was a whole different thing. And I just got a little burnt out from retail for for just a minute for mm. a blip. Mm-hmm. But I went right back to Bird of Goodman. Was, I went right back. I, you well, know. so your dream store, but what was the position you were in? I was an associate buyer in uh, the couture department, which was amazing. So that was European couture. And I worked in the division that was n- known as the fourth floor uh, under a woman named Corinne Coombe, who was the GMM of couture at Bird of Goodman. Mm-hmm. And the buyers who still I am still friendly with, yeah. a woman named Mary That's Lewis great. and a woman named... Melissa Lewis, we're still great friends. And um, they were my boss. Well, Mary Lewis was my boss about 40 years ago. And she was the buyer of Chanel, mm. Givenchy, a department called Mila Schoen, as well as Plaza Imports, which were the most beautiful European clothes, you know. So that was how I was really fulfilled. What did you feel you learned from that? Well, a taste level began to develop, number one, mm. you know, learning what the customer wanted, number two. Because Bergdorf Goodman at that time, it's a very different store now. You know, there were no escalators. It was elevator operators, and it was a very personal relationship you had with the customer. As a merchant on the, as a merchant, your office mm. was on the selling floor. By the way, you would come out from the selling floor and talk to your salespeople daily. It was a one store operation, so it was very, very personal. You bought for specific customers who you knew wanted certain merchandise. And uh, it was a very different kind of a selling. You know, it was very high end, very glamorous, very personal, very customer service oriented. Which is what it's come back to today. Exactly. And that's what Bridal's all about. Same thing. It's very customer service oriented. It's couture. You know, you, it's sort of a, a modern couture. And I know you did a, a variety of other jobs on the way. And then coming to 1996, uh, Amcel, am I saying that Amsala. right? Um, Amcel, oops, oh, yes. boy, does no, it's that okay? Okay, it's I, okay. I, I, I People apologize. People call her Amsel, Amsal. <laughs> her name is actually, actually pronounced Amsala. She is from was from was from Ethiopia. She passed away last year, unfortunately. But yeah. she was from Ethiopia. But, but I know that that she was a titan of of couture titan bridal of wear. Couture bridal, yeah. really revolutionary. Uh, it she evolved the brand, she evolved the industry into a more modern look. 
of more strapless dresses, more clean dresses, less ornamentation. Remember the eighties, think of like dynasty, that period, you know, oh, of wow. TV show, what fashion looked like. Mm-hmm. She came out with a very, very clean look because she had, couldn't find something she wanted to wear. So she designed her own dress and that began her career. And I found that, uh, so you were sales director and that at the time, this was yes. a dream job for you. Job Why for was all of this and what did you learn from that? Well, a dream because I had been in the clothing industry since 1980. So I was 16 years in various positions. I mean, I came to that job very well prepared. Mm. Not only had I been in a buying office and a, mer- and a merchandiser, I had been a designer, I had been a product developer, I had worked in production, I had been a sales, um, key, a key account sales rep, a sales manager for designer sportswear. I had a very, very be- varied background in better merchandise for mm. 16 years. Bridal, to be successful in bridal at that time as a se- selling manager, a salesperson who goes on the road and does events with brides, have to know product and product development and construction because these are couture garments. Which is going to obviously give you far more information to be able to to sell yeah. effectively to the right the right garment to the right person, and also if you're at a trunk show traveling and doing a selling event, and girls want to customize a dress, you're there on the floor with them. Yeah. you've got to know what you're talking about. So, what about overall your sales philosophy? Because I mean, we're going to get into all the other the yeah. aspect of design, all that. But as far as the sales aspect of it, that's a really critical piece. That's a huge piece, which of it. apparently yeah. you learned a ton from back then. I did. Do you have like an overall sense of of, of, a, of a philosophy for your, the way you approach the sales side of your business well it's never a hard sell you know i never was hard so i when i know when i'm personally when i'm hard sold i don't like it yeah i like to be paid attention to i like to be greeted when i walk into a a store or Mm -hmm. a situation i don't want to be ignored i don't want to be minimized or marginalized Mm -hmm. i don't be put in a box as a as a black man you know in america that's happened to me in stores too that think you don't can't afford to buy something or you're not really there to, to shop um so i want to give every customer a beautiful experience to be paid attention to to be acknowledged to be heard especially for a bride who's her first time out shopping for a dress of this magnitude yeah and she how needs, vulnerable she vulnerable must she be is, but she also has probably 25 years of dreams stored up in her head yeah. about what she wants to look like yeah. on her wedding day many of them are obsolete you know maybe you want to be cinderella when you were five but mm-hmm. maybe now you're an attorney you want to look like uh megan markle i don't know yeah yeah yeah, it's so interesting. Even just the first thing you said is just even to be acknowledged when you walk in. I mean, it, no matter how busy they are, I can't count the times when no one says anything to me. And it feels just in a, in a high to, end environment. Turn to me that, and, yeah. and look at me. Say, I'll be with you in a second. Or, That's all. Or, or hello. Welcome. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. All it takes. Yeah. So in 2002, I believe you opened your couture bridal shop. I did. What was that like? Like to make horrible. that transition? <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, it was horrible because no, it was wonderful. It was horrible because nine eleven had just happened, oh. and um, literally September twenty fourth, twenty fifth, two weeks after nine eleven, I was in my attorney's office signing the lease for this for the space that I was going into. So you, so in spite of nine eleven, you just said, That's "I'm doing thing. it." I, I'm doing it because this is talk about discretionary income. Yeah. Yeah, it w- it was rough, and I didn't know how the world was going to be. You know, the world fell apart on nine eleven, especially in New York City. Mm-hmm. We went into an immediate recession. People stopped traveling, stopped enjoying life, stopped buying. Um, and when it was a cold, rainy day, with my mother and father, went down to these because my mother and father were with me the whole way, yeah. holding my hand, financing me as they've done my entire life. I can I credit my parents, you know, more than my grandparents, but my parents for everything that was done for me and you know to me because it was amazing childhood that I had uh, and an amazing adulthood because of them as well. Yeah. But we were at the attorney's office and my mother kept saying, you sure you want to do this? We're behind you. But if you want to want to do this, you can back out. And I said, let's do it. Let's go. You know? And, and what happened was people began to celebrate life and occasions more because of nine 11 life became more precious and valuable. And who knew what was going to happen tomorrow? What would happen tomorrow? People got married. So it was a banner year for weddings in 2002 and 2003. But you didn't know that when you were making that decision. That. So, But I had no other option at that point. You know, I, I was, I'd, I'd gone, I'd put my money into this, you know, thought, thought wise. I had, um, didn't know, didn't want to go backwards into retail. You know, I'd, I'd done that for so many years. I wanted to be a store owner. I wanted to be a merchant. I wanted to control. I'm a control freak. I'm a tourist. You know, I wanted, I wanted, you know, I wanted to have my hands on something and, it'd be mine. I thought it was time after uh, 20 years in the industry of, 
a fashion industry that it was time for me to do my own thing. But was was it just pure like it sounds so courageous was did still were you scared though? I was scared, but I had a huge background in bridal. I, I'd had the support of Amsala, the blessings of Amsala who actually gifted me things that I still have today. You know, draperies from my store came out of her store. Oh. Uh, fixtures from her store came out of her store when she renovated. I had other friends, uh, Jonas and, and Ursula Hegovich, who were the work, out of Grand Co. Works that I worked for. They gifted me inventory. You know, so I had a, I had a leg up. I did, spend, of course, spend money to do things, but I had a leg up and I had, I knew that I was going to fill a niche in New York City. So you had a real strong faith in yourself too. I did. I did. And, but others had more of a strong faith in me because when the minute I said I was going to do this, yeah. even that having a retail store background as an owner and mm-hmm. a director, the, the vendors that I selected to come with me were on board. Mm. I mean, some people even left stores to come to work with me. So I knew starting out, I was going to work with Monique Lullier and Ann Barge and Peter Langner, you know, and Carolina Herrera. This was huge to start off. You what know, a wonderful way to jump yeah, into this. Yeah, it was pretty good. Despite, so despite the air, yeah. you know, literally the air, because the air did stink. Yeah, you know, I came and visited here horrible. two weeks after I know. And, you know, the smell of death was in the terrible. air was hor- yeah. horrible. People began to celebrate and began to smile again, and that's what happened. And also, you know, before we get in, you were in your early 40s, I believe. I was. <laughs> don't, don't bring it up. Well, I'm, but I'm, I'm also was. thinking of yes. Sylvia Weinstock, who has you know, been on the show. Yeah. She was 50 when she started yes. her business. Yeah. And I love hearing that. I mean, for yeah. me, starting this podcast at a later age but i think people <laughs> need to you know it doesn't matter right doesn't matter. if you got the passion and yeah it you- doesn't matter look I, I i think i have a useful useful youthful spirit you know my parents and grandparents had that as well so it's never about the number it's about how you feel and i was i was ready so let's dig in you know in terms okay. of uh i would love to know in terms of choosing a designer in an interview that i that i found you said every designer in your store needs to have a definitive point of view and yes. a vision for their collection yes i have my assumptions but what did you mean by that well it means why would you duplicate yourself in a store a store of my size which is relatively small why would you have three and four designers who, who do the same thing mm. you know because you want to i want to present the best i want to present the most curated collection that i can to a to an audience it's a very edited collection so i choose each designer specifically for what they do best and you know for what their strengths are do you have any particular concept philosophy about how you choose your designers well um i've been asked the question a lot a lot is based on a personal feeling because you're gonna you kind of you kind of like going into bed with somebody really. Yeah. You think about that. Yeah. You got to like them instinctually. Number one, instinctively, number one. Yeah. You got to like. I think you got to like the person you're you're in business with. You have to like with love what they do. You have to love their integrity. You have to love their consistency. Bridal is not like ready to wear. Bridal is a. Let's put it break it down. It's one dress perhaps that's in white. That could be in your store for one month or 10 years. It needs to be produced the same way every time you order that dress for the customer. Mm. So it's about a long-term relationship of being consistent and being ethical. That's really mm. what it's about. Well, and I also read that you mentioned uh, looking at the branding and the marketing. That's because, really that's important too. Because, because let's face it, my customers are very savvy. They're fashion forward. They're fashion people, professional. They're influenced by fashion and by brands, just, just as I am. I think everybody in America mm-hmm. is very brand aware. And, you know, sometimes when you have a little small young designer, that's fine too, because you can help nurture them and they're going to get a lot of attention by the press if, if they do so. But you want to be with brands that are going to bring you traffic to the store. You know, so marketing is a key element of it. I, I can market things. You know, I've come to a status in my life where my name has a little weight. Well, yeah. Put my name on something, sure. it can sell. But ultimately, in the beginning, I didn't know that. I had no idea. That evolved over the years. I get That's interesting. So... Uh, and also, if you had to categorize styles, I'm, I wonder, like classic and elegant, uh, how would you do that? And, and what are the characteristics of each, the way you look at it? Well, for example, in my, my store, I think there's a, an elevated style that pervades my whole store. It's, it's, you, will, you may not find the dress you like. But you really can't say the dresses are ugly. You know what I mean? And you go to some stores, then the variety of dresses is mind-blowing. You look at them on the floor. To me, my personal taste is, wow, that's a bad-looking dress. Mm. You know? So they're all pretty well-made here. They're quite artistically beautiful. They're crafted beautifully. They're beautiful. They're just beautiful dresses to me. They're a fashion point of view. Yeah. Um, 
So I would say my style is more contem- modern contemporary. It's not so traditional, but I have gowns. I've vendors who straddle traditional, like an Anne Barge and a Lila Rose, who are more classic, and a, and, a, and a Carolina Herrera. I have more modern designers who are more edgy, like an Angel Sanchez and Monique, Monique Lillier. You know, it depends, but it's all under the level layer of taste. You know, taste level is what it what, and, well, and price point, of course. You know, and I like how earlier you said, uh, you know, beautiful, and and you, I again, I I looked you up, but Mark, I read you read that. Um, I love this. You said each gown is an elegant work of art. It is. I love yes. that phrase, yeah. though. Like, I, I feel moved when I think of it that way. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, you, if you're passionate about this industry, you know, you don't go into this, trust me, to make a whole lot of money. It's about loving what you do. And I love dresses. I love working with brides. I love being on the selling floor. These are all things from my childhood, again, yeah. that were the retail experience, the retail as theater experience, you know, which is coming back now because now with retail, giant retail stores sort of floundering what are we going to do they're creating experiences for people we've bridal salons have always been experienced people you're coming here for a particular reason yeah and we're trying to help help you satisfy that reason well and i think i saw a picture of, of people holding champagne yeah you know, it was celebratory so, you know yeah. it's a celebratory thing you don't pop that champagne too early because then i get a little distracted you know <laughs> when the brides come in and it's a champagne brunch with there's nothing worse than brides coming with their gaggle of girlfriends I, I after, get to after that. a champagne oh, okay. brunch you know <laughs> oh, and their, no. their mind is not and heart is not on shopping I, you've it's, seen it all and i've seen you? it all i've seen everything yeah. trust me yeah that's not fun for us that is really fun well in terms of the experience yeah it re- it, it it really seems like i when i think about it um obviously the night of their wedding you know yes. that's the ultimate that's but, it but yeah it coming here i would think it's so it's a dream of, of women to come in and get a get yeah. their gown. At the same time, it's got to be one of the hardest things they've ever done because it's they know hard. they're going to be, you know, watched, looked at. They are the center yes. of attention. Yes, as yes. M- exciting as that is, at the same time, I'm sure yeah. there's there's this vulnerability, right? And I think you know, girls who I think are more into fashion are more vulnerable because this is the defining dress. Oh, interesting. You see? It's the defining dress that culminates their entire life to that day of who they are. So the pressure on them, and I'm going to tell you, it's not. It's not that. But in everybody's mind, it is that. Because the wedding ceremony is so important. The wedding is so important. So the pressure is put on themselves to be perfection and nobody's perfect. You know what I mean? Like nobody makes perfect, but God, I say yeah. uh, a rock is perfect and it's imperfection. You know what I mean? That's right. just that way it is. So the pressure on the girl to be perfect has, has escalated because of also social media and the fact that you're being seen everywhere you're posting, you're being posted, you know, you're this, you're that you're also comparing yourself to, you know, a celebrity on the runway who wore a similar dress or who got married, you know, the Royal wedding. So there's all these pressures that are different now that did not exist even 20 years ago. Well, and I'm imagining, ago. I'm imagining for you, your experience of um, someone walking in, and, and I'm sure most people I would think are feeling very vulnerable, they are, are yes. anxious about it, you know, excited, but also anxious. And to, to uh, you're a part of watching that transformation. Right, to kind of walk them through it. You yeah. Know? We, we actually, like, we call ourselves psychologists and psycho- psychoanalysts <laughs> yeah. because we deal with all the drama also of the family and the family dynamic. Right. The dynamic, the drama of the, and what's in the girl's head about, you know, choosing the right dress and who she looks to for references and, and opinions and advice. You know, what's her internal struggle? What's her struggle with her mother or her father about this whole thing or even her fiance? You know, it's, it's incredible. And they exp- I imagine that gets to the point where they, when they feel comfortable with you, that they're expressing this to you. Sometimes it's not even nonverbal. It's oh. it's really a physical thing, a physical reaction, especially in the fittings. You know, when girls are reacting to their actual dress and they're they're doing things with their body that makes you know you got to focus on that area. When they keep patting down their hips, that oh. means they want the skirt to be a little narrower because everybody thinks a big dress means you got big hips. You know what I mean? <laughs> and God forbid you got big hips. You know what I mean? In New York, if you're size six, social X-ray of a big oh, figure. You know what I mean? So you know, it's all these sort of psychological, physical, uh, emotional, and physical cues you're seeing, uh, behavior. You know, a strong reaction, but a lot of cues are also verbal and, and they're going to tell you, I don't want this. I mean, a girl does come with a wishes. I don't want to wear lace. I don't want a ball gown. I don't want to have color. I don't want it to have a long train. There's certain things that are definitive that girls really do want mm-hmm. or think they do want until you put them in the dress and then everything starts and you from know. ground zero yeah. again. But you have to, they have to, they, they got to go through the process. See it. And you owe them that process. You yeah. owe them that. You, you, owe, the thing is, when the bride comes to a bridal salon, you must listen to them. You must. You can't impose your 
your yourself right, on it's them. Their process. It's their process. You have to go through. You might know how you can educate them to think to as to what is better for them, mm-hmm. what looks best on them. They may not even know what looks best on them. In their mind, like I said, they want to be for Cinderella for that day, perhaps. Maybe a big old poofy ball gown when you're five foot two and very full chested is gonna look like look like a marshmallow. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you'd be better served with something more sleek or something more A line or something that elongates the body. The things that we know, it's just like a science, you know, dressmaking, dress design, dressing people it's an art well and i know that you need to hear what they have to say but i still yeah. but i still imagine that when they walk in you must immediately start to be getting ideas oh yeah when i work with a client the I moment they right. walk in well you know you have if you have a little background especially if you know you know the beauty of what we do is a little now with social media and how you even contact a store you kind of know ahead of time you know um what the girl's coming in for. She gives you enough information to uh, her, her wedding date, her venue, kind of her budget, these things, and her job. That that can de- determine a lot of, of what you're going to expect. Of course, you can, the unexpected does happen sometimes. you know. And like I said, you can't profile anybody by the way they look. I don't, I don't want to be profiled or put in a box. Somebody comes in looking kind of schleppy, <laughs> and next thing you know, they're walking out with the most fabulous $40,000 creation <laughs> because they're that amazing you know the vision there's money and the, and the style to do it well do you have a process yourself of uh like a questioning process is there some clear formula it's, i i would think at this point for you so much is intuitive and you're just yeah but you going have, with you the have, moment you have to reinforce the you have to you have to reconnect with them in terms of what they put on paper or what they put on to get their appointment here you want to reinforce those answers and reassure that this is what they, we're, we're, we're going for a price point a range of price is very important. It's not necessarily the best thing to get involved with showing dresses that are very expensive when someone's price point is much lower. Mm-hmm. It can break their heart because it's hard to go backwards. It's always easy to go back up, to go up. It's hard to go down yeah. style-wise. And um, you want to make sure that you're addressing you know, the appropriate kind of dress. You know, where is a wedding taking place? Is it, is it a wedding? Is, I mean, is it, is it a beach? Is it a country club? Is it a, you know, a loft someplace in Soho? Is it a castle in spain this all dictates you know what the dress could look like could, not necessarily yeah. should because it's still the bride's prerogative but could you can take them to its place in their mind of what the wedding you can envision the wedding with them well and then following from there doesn't the decor and a lot of the other f- decisions follow yes and depends on what stage the bride is in when she comes to shop with you if she's like a year out she will have to have a, a date really to, to be serious about shopping for a dress a wedding date and a venue. Those things are, and she has the ring, but mm-hmm. she has the fiance, the ring, a wedding date, and a venue. Those are, those are four really important things to start the shopping process. And that yeah. could be a year or a year and a half out. This, these days, girls are so busy, it could be a full year or more out. Starting with a planner or whatever, where you've, where you've booked your wedding and how you're going to have your wedding, that dictates really the kind of dress that you should wear that's appropriate for that venue. So we know that information when, they, when we ask them where you're having your wedding. Oh my God, it's that. So and so, so and so. Oh my God, that's amazing! You know, what do you envision? What are the? Do you have, have you chosen flowers? Have you done decor? Yes, I've chosen. You know, my color scheme is this. You know, we'll have we'll have birds flying over, dropping. You know, and you're confetti. seeing this in your mind, and you know, whatever. It's at a certain a castle, yeah, or a it's castle. at this hotel, or we, it's outside. Yeah, we, we we know a lot of the venues because they, they keep coming up. You know, there's certain New York venues that are so iconic, like the Plaza Hotel and the Pierre Hotel. You know, those are important. If you're having a wedding at the Pierre Hotel. You know it's an important wedding. Yeah, actually, Bill Spinner you know. and Ashford Bijou were both on the show. Yes, yeah. yes. But anyway. you know, if you're having a wedding at the at the Plaza Hotel, yeah. it's an important wedding in New York City, mm-hmm. St. Regis, you know, or more modern hotels like uh, the Mandarin Oriental. You, you know, the caliber of wedding we're talking about with a certain level of budget we're talking about. These well, these girls are not going to be skimping on little little details. Well, and earlier you were mentioning you know white, uh, yeah. but. I now I meant, see. I meant, it's really ivory. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, it's not really white. Okay, I didn't mean. Yeah, yeah but in white. terms of uh, other colors other than ivory, yeah. you know, I'm noticing uh, every once in a while, and I love, I, I don't know how to describe it, very, very light, like very light uh, cloud pink. blue yes, kind of, blue. or pink. Well, we've come I in, love that. Yeah, it's, you know, that's been happening for years. You have to credit people like uh, Vera Wang and Monique Lullier for bringing a lot of color into bridal, first in the way of like accessories, you know, Vera Wang with the black sash was 
was instrumental in, in moving the fashion forward. You know, uh, Monique Lullier in the colored sashes of the gold and the blue and the green and the pinks. And then you talk about um, the last few years, we've been into a very naked period of dresses where dresses appear to be naked because of nude linings. Mm -hmm. So ivory shell with nude lining creates a whole different sort of transparent feeling or the use of blush tones to mix with ivory and white. We've coming in a very, very long period of, of these sort of beautiful flesh colored dresses that look more flattering to the skin than say stark white i wonder if someday there will be more non-ivory non-white than that i think so that. i think we're moving in that direction I mean, girls have come in asking for black dresses black dresses red dresses and because culturally too well it indian depends. weddings yeah, isn't indian red and chinese, a big deal? And chinese yes they yeah. want to wear red they have to wear red for part of the ceremony mm -hmm. for part of their you know part uh, of the process it could be stunning it's stunning you know i've had girls buy red dresses from us of course People are more modern. A lot of celebrities are wearing non-white dresses and they're following, the brides are following that sort of direction. Mm -hmm. And I forget when I think it was, um, either it was pink or some big, 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 uh, Gwen Stefani got married. She wore a sort of almost not tie dye, but it was a degradé, like a dipped dress where the, the color was most intense at the bottom, but it soaked up in the chiffon from a, from a red to a pale pink. Mm. And so many girls came in. This first time I saw somebody come in with such a tear sheet of like, I want this kind of a dress, you know, <laughs> yeah. pink, red, like, wow, we, you know, we didn't have it to show at the time. What about couture wedding dresses that are just completely made to order? Well, every dress in my store is couture for the most part, you know, and there's two meanings. There's haute couture and there's couture, you know, there's couture by, by couture. We mean it's made to order. You really don't walk in here expecting to leave with the dress that, with the dress that day. No. You know, sample sale. If you want to buy a sample, that's one thing. A sample, that's another thing. Couture just means that it's being produced for you specifically and often to your measurements. The other process you go through, the really the high couture process is when you're starting from a conception or concept That's what I meant. with yeah. starting from conception or to concept yeah. with a designer where you're working with, um, first of all, a sketch, and then it goes to a cotton or muslin phase where you're seeing a dress being put on you in a, in a raw state, in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a simple fabric. We're taking really, you know, making more tweaks to the neckline, to the shape of the skirt. Then it's actually fabricated into the fabric, and then you're doing a lo lot of fittings. Most of most stores of my caliber, we don't do that. That's something that's, you know, it's in our it's in our realm. What we can do. You do. love it when it. Oh, I love it when it happens. Yeah. It's very very labor intensive. Yeah. But the girl has to have the vision. You got to be the right customer to do that. Interesting. She's got she's got she's to be right there with you. Interesting. You know, because that could be a disaster. As, as well as, as as joyful and wonderful as it is, and sophisticated, it can be a disaster. And a lot. And I ran a lot of girls who do that process directly with designers run back to the store, you know, two months before their wedding. I hate my dress. It's not what I envisioned, you know. And then you have to scramble to get something for them off yeah. the rack. You know? Well, and you have a new line. I Tell do. me about that. I do. Well, I have yeah. my own line. It's called Mark Ingram by Valentini. And I'm so excited because it's my, it's my like lifelong dream really to be a designer, one of my passions. And after being in the industry for so many years, I was approached by this wonderful bridal house in, Italy, in Puglia, Italy called Valentina's. Valentini Sposa. Mm -hmm. I've been buying their collection for a few years and working with uh -huh. them and doing a little product development here and there, you know, tweaking some styles for my own inventory. And they said, why don't we do a, a collection together? Collab collaborate. So, I mean, my God, what it was handed to me on a and plate. They came to you. They That's came fantastic. to me. It was handed to me on a plate. So I said, well, let's do it. And yeah. here we are, 20 styles in, you know, my first season. Uh, I'm not selling to the in the US except for my own store this year, but we I, I've had a following and told I had a following in Asia, which is kind of crazy. Wow. But every time I go to market, a lot of the Asian customers recognize me for my appearances on television, oh. you know, podcasts from the videos that I've done, the TV work, the, you know, whatever I've done. My average, I've had my face in my ads for many, many years. I did that before a lot of other people did to brand my store versus my lines i sure. branded myself as a sure. brand i became a brand in most people's uh, mind i have been a designer for all these years That's they were surprised that they said where's the marketing addresses well there's no marketing addresses there's there's monique and there's carolina and there's you know vera but there's no marketing addresses but now there are marketing addresses in the store and i think they're quite beautiful they're my point of view they're based on having a you know 20 some odd year career in the industry and knowing what brides want to wear what proportion is right for them, you know, all the questions that are asked, can we make this change, that change, and this change, you know, on that dress have become what my line's all about. You know, mm. I wouldn't say I'm a seasoned designer, but 
creative. I have design background. I have an eye. I know fabrics. I know construction. So, you know, what can I tell you? Well, congratulations. <laughs> well, thank congratulations, you. Thank Mark. you so much. That's I'm so incredible. excited about it. Yeah. And, and I definitely will want to get pictures for the show notes you oh, know, of yours. Sure, and we'll sure. caption them so people know. For sure. So, you know, I know that this is very basic, but I, I, I want to be clear in terms of trunk shows and how you prepare for them. First of all, can you define for anyone who may not be dead clear what a trunk show is and then how do you prepare for them? Okay, a trunk show has evolved, but a trunk show technically is, they call it a trunk show because in the old days, representatives traveled with trunks from store to store to store, showing merchandise that was not available on the selling floor. It was a preview of the season. Mm -hmm. It remains a preview of the season. Now they're sent to the store by FedEx, DHL, whatever, Messenger, they arrive. It's an opportunity for a bride, if she's following a certain designer brand or a collection, to see the entire collection, let's say the newest pieces that were just off the runway, before the store has a chance to buy them or even receive them as inventory. Mm. So it's a pretty serious event. You should come to a trunk show only if you're interested in seeing that designer, because oftentimes you can only try on that designer that weekend. So you should have your mindset that you want to buy a dress and that you're serious about it. It's a selling event is what it is. And they sometimes show up sometimes, right? The designers? Oh, yes. In the old days, they always came to the trunk show. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they have more seasoned representatives who can come and actually work with the brides one-on-one -on, -one on, on how to fit them and that sort of thing. And what are some of the pitfalls or mishaps to be prepared for? And a trunk the show. The biggest fear. No. And then go for the wedding. You know, this is the biggest fear of every bride. The biggest fear a bride can have is missing her wedding in terms of her dress not being there for her wedding. That's, you know, other than her groom not showing up. I'm shocked up. that people worry about that. I mean, of course it's going to be ready, right? Of course it's going to be ready. And if you're working with a reputable store, it's going to be ready. If, <laughs> yeah. if you're working with a designer who's making your dress from scratch or some store that, you know, closes in the night, you know, it all depends on where you shop and how you shop for your dress. But hopefully you have your dress weeks before your wedding, mm -hmm. at least a full week before your wedding. We don't allow a dress to go out that close to a wedding date because anything can happen. I'll never, never forget in the maybe second year of my business, there was a huge blackout in New York city in August and that businesses were shut down. It was on a Thursday. If you're getting married on a Friday or a Saturday, you know, we couldn't even get into our, we were in an elevator building, couldn't get upstairs to get their dresses. It was a mess. So you can't, Leave that to chance. You know, mm. anything can happen. There could be a flood, a disaster, natural disaster. How about the hurricanes that came oh, here? Good point. Yeah, can't I have, even be delivered. I have a friend who had her wedding on the weekend of the last major hurricane. Her venue was destroyed in New York City. She had to choose a second, a new venue within days. Had to make that decision to move forward. It was that stressful. Now that stress. The dress is nothing, peanuts compared to having your venue disappear from you. But yeah. what about things like stains and being concerned about that? Well, yeah. You don't want them to walk on tiptoes the no, whole night. No, of course not. And, you know, it is a dress and it's a party. So you have to remember that this thing is not that precious. You know, it, it's to be worn. It will get dirty. Hmm. It will get stepped on. Your bustle may come down. You know, it's a fabric. I'd say the best thing for you to do is have a dresser with you the day of your wedding. If you haven't had a planner the whole time, the best investment you can make is someone the day of your wedding, have seamstresses come who can help you get into your dress, get out of your dress, fix a stain, take out a stain, fix a bustle that fell down, fix a broken zipper, get a lipstick stain out, get a wine stain out. These are things that are going to happen. Because and then they can have peace of mind too. Exactly. I think that's probably the most some important Some don't worry aspect. about that, but yeah. some who are meticulous, yeah. particular, need to have a dresser. You can't, that can't fall in the store. We've done our best, you know. We're not with you at that at when you're actually in the dress wearing it. You know, also I know that you are you're traveling all over the world. I am now. Can you tell me about that? Online especially. Yeah. Tell me that's well, got to be what is that like? First for of you? all, I love traveling. I've always been a great traveler. Uh -huh. And my parents it comes from being my child with my parents. We went we we had, you know, places to go every year in the Caribbean. We went in the summer, went to the Caribbean in the winter. You know, we went to Charleston to see my parents' family. We always traveled a lot, you know, that I began to go to Europe when I was a teenager. So mm. Europe is my favorite place to be other than, other than New York City, I'd say in Miami, where I also have a home. My, I think London, Paris are my favorite, and Italy, the country of Italy is my favorite place oh. to be in general. A any place in Italy, just drop me off. I'm happy. <laughs> I'll go I'm to. Just, I'm, I'm happy with the food, the culture, the people, everything is beautiful. And so... That's a natural thing that I do anyway. I travel. Then because I have an international uh, clientele and also an international repertoire of designers, I must often have to go to them to buy it. So there are bridal, important bridal markets, not only in New York, 
but there are important, very important bridal markets in Barcelona where you've, I found a lot of new talent in Barcelona. Those designers who can't afford to come to New York to show, it's mm. very costly to come here, costly to come to New York and show. Uh, I go to Milan market, especially this year, to show my own collection because it's based in Italy and uh, a lot of Italian stores wanted to see it. So I had to come go to Milan market. Then I had to go to, I went to Kyoto market to present my line because I have a quote unquote following in Asia, which I found out that I do because a lot of stores bought my line. Well, also though, Mark, not to interrupt you, but in China, I, I understand the interest in weddings is growing like crazy. crazy. Well, they're the new middle class. They have money. Yes. You know, there's, yes. there's all the emerging economies. There, we, there's we, now more airports right. anywhere in the world. We've than seen the, this you happen. Know. You know, my brides, my farm brides came from particular places in the last 20 years that I've been in business. When I first opened, everybody came from Arabia and Russia. That's where all the big money was for girls flying in to buy dresses and flying out. And then Europe was huge. London, Scotland, Ireland, huge countries to come from to buy dresses in America. Then the, then the, then the, uh, then the euro changed everything. Mm-hmm. You know, the inflation changed everything. The value of the money changed everything. Now, uh, we have a huge Latin American contingent coming up from mm-hmm. Mexico, from all of Central America, all of South America. We have girls coming from Nigeria by way of London who have lots of you know, discretionary income to spend on dresses because also weddings are becoming more important because of social media and because of the publicity, the big, important Western wedding, you know, is really important, very important to a lot of girls. But China is the new emerging market. Yeah. So what is a typical day like for you? Is there a typical day when you're traveling and you're doing this? Well, a typical day for work travel, uh, going to a market in, say, Barcelona is, you know, arriving a day before or too earlier to get acclimated because the worst thing is jet lag. You've got to do some serious decision making when you're there. And also a lot of socializing because you're being either wine and dine or you're wine and dining somebody. And in Barcelona, the culture is very late. It's Spain. So dinners don't happen until 10 30 at right. night. <laughs> yeah. So you got to get to Spain a day ahead of ahead of yourself and ahead of ahead of, and just kind of get yourself acclimated. Mm-hmm. And then you start making the rounds of the shows and the bridal appointments and walking the market testing out, looking for new, new talent, uh, having dinners, having going to cocktail parties. It's, it's fun, but it's also work. You're on your feet all day and you're, you're, you're being very disciplined and very discerning as to what you want to pick up for your store because you can't buy everything. Mm -hmm. You know, if you see 10 new collections that you really think are amazing, you know, what are the two or three, maybe four that you can pick up? And again, I go back to the things. What are my criteria? What do the gowns look like? What is the marketing? That they've mm-hmm. done, you know, what is the presentation? Do I like them as people? It's all the same criteria that I use for American designers, you know, even more so because I don't even know them. It's something brand new for me. You know, also earlier you spoke a couple times about being black, you know, in the industry. Well, being black in the world, being black in the yeah. industry. And it seems to me that I, I'm surprised that even now it's here it is in the middle of 2019 that minorities are still well, obviously what's going on politically, it's right. it's very it scary help. and getting work. But but in the even before that started to happen in, in politics again, again, uh, in the wedding industry, it's still, I don't understand why minorities are, are such a minority. They are a minority in the industry. And, I, and I'll, I'm going to say one thing. I've never, never played the race card. I don't believe in that for myself. I never had to. I was very, very fortunate to grow up, grow up in a very integrated, very intercultural uh, culture, society in New York City. My parents made a point of that. I wasn't an underprivileged child. You know, mm-hmm. I was a child who was able to be exposed to a lot of things from wonderful grandparents to parents to travel. You know, my neighborhoods were always mixed. My school was, was were always mixed. My parents specifically sought out summer camps, you know, even sleepaway camps that were called in those days integrated and intercultural. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes, in 19, I started going to summer camp in 68, sleepaway camp for the summer. What a brilliant way for, yeah, for kids of all nationalities all, to exactly. understand that we're kids. We're all kids. And we also had international counselors. So I had counselors from Korea Israel, Germany, uh, Jamaica, Africa, kids who I became friendly with who were Jewish, who were Christian, you know, were Muslim and uh, rich, poor. It was really quite a great experience for me. Important for anybody to have Mm -hmm. that kind of, well, I call that being well-rounded more than anything else is having that love of people, understanding of different cultures and, um, you know, empathy for other people. Yeah. Very important. Are you having to deal uh, uh, even nowadays with this, with the fact that, 
Not myself, you know. I would say I do see it. My, your my reputation, you think? I have friends, uh, black friends in the industry who are planners and designers who feel they don't get a fair shake, you know, in terms of exposure with the with the press and the media. And I understand that it's true. Um, I understand that sometimes we, you know, as a culture, are not as um, financially able sometimes to do. In in, in general, I'm saying mm-hmm. great generalities here. Yeah, not financially able. To, to be to do this it's a very expensive thing to be in it takes capital it takes financing it takes you know loans from banks it takes parents it takes mm. you know so I had this I had a background that allowed me to have all these things mm. I wouldn't have had it without my parents it's just this way I, go. I mean I'm determined enough maybe I would have gotten it because I'm that determination yeah a lot of it is determination too you got to fight you got you can't take no for an answer and you got to be proud and you got to stand up for yourself at this point in your career do you still feel that you that, i'm not talking now about being a minority but just in terms of an industry and the level of success maintaining it continuing to grow do you still feel that sense of determination is still necessary now it's necessary is there only, a certain amount of having arrived it's necessary only because of technology and because of social media the changes in our society have make it necessary for you to always go the next level Mm -hmm. because the customer is now telling you what they want. We, in the old days, we told the customer what they wanted and it's very different. Now you've got to be right there with them. They're telling you what they want. They're telling you how they want to shop, when they want to shop, what they want to shop for, what they want to pay for it, how they want to find you. If you're not there, you're not found. It's as simple as that. That's the biggest challenge. And I I feel like I'm an old person, you know? So luckily you surround yourself with younger people who know, all these things, you know, you have younger consultants who come work for you, younger receptionists, younger PR people, younger, you know, younger social media team who influence you, you know, who help you. Fr- young, I, have young, I have also young friends. I have a very young, I feel like I have a young spirit. So again, I have friends that range from their 20s. I have a niece who's 24. I listen mm-hmm. to what she tells me. I have, I have friends, people in my life from 20s to, to you know, to the grave. So well, not at the grave, but you know, 22, yeah. senior citizen level. Yeah, listen, my mother told me, she told me sometimes, <laughs> you always want to have older friends. Yes, you do. And you want to have younger friends. Younger friends. <laughs> keep, you they keep you both. young. They keep yeah, you young. All of it. Yeah. So, but so, so really, you are embracing the change in that sense that that's yeah. how you're dealing with it. <laughs> Trust me, I'm dragging my feet. And a lot of my, my peers in the industry are too, because we're, we're all mom and pop businesses, you know? And we've been doing this decades. Decades. And it's always been a formula that worked yes. for us. There were certain months that girls bought. <laughs> yeah. There were certain trunk sh- certain things you had that guaranteed you'd sell something, uh-huh. and it's all turned on its head right now, completely. Well, before we wrap up, I'd like to also know what you would recommend to wedding planners and designers as far as talking with their brides about the gown. About the gown. Generally speaking, main points. Well, as I said earlier, you know, you cannot view the gown as the be-all and end-all thing that's going to make your wedding day or your wedding monumental. You know, Mm -hmm. it's about your energy. It's about how you feel about your fiance, how you feel about getting married. It's a marriage, not a wedding. That's the most important. So remember, it's a marriage first Mm and a wedding. That's most important. The dress is an icing on the cake, you know, sort of, so to speak, (laughs) of how you want to present yourself. It doesn't have to be your it should be your best self is what it should be. It should be your, how you want to look your best and be remembered in because there's always going to be photographs, maybe not physical photographs any longer, but digital, digital photographs. Yeah. There'll be a record of how you look. And, but don't be, don't get bogged down with every aspect of your body. Don't, don't diet down to nothing. Don't, you know, don't exercise to excess where you don't even look like yourself. I always say that when you got engaged to your fiance, he loved you just like that at that moment. So present yourself on your wedding day just like that, just your best self that mm. day, not some other person who also becomes became a bridezilla in the process, became mean, who became mean-spirited, who became insensitive, who became uh, these things to her family, to her friends, people who work with her, you know, to, to help her with the wedding. You know, keep, keep an open heart, open mind, keep kindness. That's what I say. I love that. And before we close, you know, Mark, I would love to know, how do you personally define success? How do you think about that? You know, it's evolved over the years. It used to be about money and who's traveling and what you're wearing and where you're going. And as I get older and more and more as I pare down, it's just happiness and whatever that brings me. You know, it's having amazing friends and family and having the opportunity sometimes to do nice things like travel 
to come home to a beautiful home that at least whatever that means, it's clean, it's comfortable, it's yours to have food in your stomach. You know, that's those important things in life. You know, as I've lost two parents in the last three years, mm. you know, talk about sadness and yeah. grief and stress. You know, that's, that's horrible. I've lost some friends recently, mm-hmm. you know, suddenly that's mind boggling to me. So tomorrow's not, pro- my mother would always say tomorrow is not promised live for today. Mm. So I'm trying to live for today. That's my happiness and success is living for today and coming in every day with an open mind about change. So what is the best way for people to find you? The best way would be to, of course, I guess, well, word of mouth has been the biggest way they're finding me now. Thank God. I've been in business 20, 20 some odd years, 20 years. And, um, and your website and website, social media. Website, social handles. media, you know, website, social media, animals. Um, which is just to be. Which is, uh, well, let's see. Instagram would be Mark Ingram Bride. Uh, our website is Mark Ingram Atelier.com. Uh, you know, look up all of our handles. Do you know you what? I'll us. put, we'll put all, all of this will be in the show notes for Please people. Do. They'll find it. Find there. us on Facebook, Instagram. You'll find us everywhere. Our website. Uh, we, you know, have a presence in a lot of, uh, virtual magazines. We are on television, you know, and I have my own collection. So there's a lot of ways to find us. Uh, we are by appointment only. That's, we find the best way to get the best service to be by appointment only. We're not a walk in shop and, um, you know, visit our website. And, and call, contact well, us. This has been a pleasure, Mark. Really, I really enjoyed talking Thank to you. you. Thank I you it so much, too. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Mark Ingram. Be sure to check out his site at markingramatelier.com. Again, markingramatelier.com. His Instagram handle, social media handles, are Mark Ingram Bride. Again, on Instagram, Mark Ingram Bride. And you can find all of this in the show notes at our website at theweddingbiz.com. Be sure to follow us at The Wedding Biz. Ooh, I got to get used to saying that because uh, we finally got our own name back. So, The Wedding Biz. Definitely follow us at The Wedding Biz and, and share this with uh, your friends and colleagues. You know, it's such a unique interview of Mark. And be sure to review us and give us top ratings if you can. It really helps with the show tremendously, helps people find us. And don't forget to uh, listen to the follow-on segment on Wednesday, which happens with every interview called The Next Level, in which I have a guest co-host. And we talk about some of the highlights of the show in order to help deliver them as, as real specific tips for you to elevate your own business. And to announce next week's guest, it is going to be Meryl Snow, very, very well-known consultant in the industry. She's a consultant. She's a sales trainer, speaker, event producer, designer. She puts together think tank workshops. I'm going to leave it at that. You got to check it out next week. So we want to also thank our sponsor of the show, Kushner Entertainment, who you can find at kushnerentertainment.com. And thanks for listening to The Wedding Business.